going? Um, hello and good morning, everybody. Um, I hope that you've got a cup of tea or coffee and some morning tea with you. Um, I'd like to, on behalf of the Yay River Catchment Land Care Group and the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority, welcome you to today. Um, it's the first uh, session, the basics in our soils and soil test interpretation webinar series with Kath Botter. Um, my name is Rhiannon. I work for the Goldman Broken CMA based in the Yay office in Victoria. Uh, that's relevant because we've got people from all over the country joining us today. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Goldman Broken catchment, the Yorta Yorta and Tonorong people, um, and would like to acknowledge their unique connection to country. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you are sitting today and where you're joining us from. This series has been organised by Judy Brooks and the Yay River Catchment Land Care Group together with the Goulburn Broken CMA and it's funded through the Australian Government um, through the National Land Care Program and is part of our From the Ground Up project. Uh, I do need to run through some administration stuff with you so please bear with me um, and I'll let you know how the session will run. I also have to keep checking my notes because anyone that knows me know I tend to run off uh, script. So please note that we are recording the session today. It will be published online and it will be sent to you. Um, if this presents any privacy issues for you, please have a think about how you're going to manage, manage that. Um, we, due to the number of participants online today and the bandwidth required for that, we will have cameras switched off um, and also please mute your microphone uh, if it's not done, just to reduce the background noise and um, limit distractions. Um, just running through how to do that, if you move your mouse over your screen, I see Karen's working in the background um, muting people, but if you move your mouse over your screen, a little bar will pop up about three quarters of the way down. Um, you'll see a camera and a microphone icon, and if you click on those, um, you will turn off your camera and your microphone. Uh, you will also see a chat bubble um, in that bar. Um, if you click on this, a chat screen will pop up. Uh, if it doesn't turn up, then you will... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Um, so if it if it doesn't pop up, unfortunately, you're one of the lucky ones. There is uh, something that goes on in the background with Teams and we haven't been able to resolve that. Um, if you don't have a chat box, please use my uh, email to send me through questions. I'm just typing it in the chat box now. You should see that there. Um, We'll be monitoring the chat box for questions today and we'll be using this function for our um, for our question and answer session. Um, thank you to those who have already submitted questions. Um, Kath has worked those into her presentation um, and it's a really useful thing for presenters to know what sort of information you're after and, and where you're coming from. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of Kath's presentation, which will go until about 11.30. Um, but feel free to type in the chat box as we go um, and we'll get to your questions. Can I just ask everybody now to please take a few seconds to type your name and where you are from into the chat box so we can see so we can see where we're coming from. I've just had a text from a participant. Can you see my, I wonder, can we see my email address in the, in the chat box? Yes, yes I've, seen I've seen it there. Thanks, Kath. Great, we've got some names popping up. Uh, Alfred from Tatura, Maria from Albury Taith, uh, 
John from Mansfield, Kat from the Upper Goulburn Land Care Network, Jess from Camperdown, Scott from Moira Shire, Narelle from Broadford. Welcome everyone. Anne from Tallarook, Audrey from Mitamita, Barbara from Barbara from Clunes. Thanks everyone. I always like to get a bit of an idea of um, who's um, who's online, where you're from. Uh, Judy Brooks from Yay River Catchment Land Care Group, Sue Apted from Arthur's Creek, um, Catherine from Moira Shire. I'm getting emails coming through now for all of those um, folks who don't have the chat box. Joe Cummins from Shepparton. Thanks, Joe. Josh from Yan Doit is here. Rebecca from Upper Camp Aspie Land Care. Thanks, guys. If you just keep those um, coming through, um, I'd now like to introduce Kath, who's waiting patiently for me to finish rambling. Thanks, Kath. Kath's our presenter for this series. Um, Kath works extensively as a soil scientist, educator and facilitator with rural and regional communities. Um, she has been a lecturer in soil science at the University of Melbourne um, at Dukey College and also has worked for the Department of Agriculture in extension programs focused on soil health. Kath holds a Bachelor and Masters of Science in Ag and Science in Agriculture and a Graduate Certificate in Soil Conservation. She is an accredited soil scientist. Sorry, she is accredited by Soil Science Australia as a certified professional soil scientist. That one is a tongue twister. She also holds a certificate for in training and assessment. Uh, Kath lives in Benalla and is now working as a consultant. Uh, recently, Kath published the small reference book that all of you should now have, either in a hard copy or online. And if you've requested a hard copy and it hasn't arrived, it's on its way to you. Um, it, this booklet is a guide specifically designed to demystify the complexity of soil tests and to support key farm decisions. Uh, the booklet was a collaborative project with the Yay River Catchment Land Care Group, local editor Judy Brooks and the Goulburn Broken CMA. Um, and the books have been posted as far as Tassie, Western Australia, South Australia and into New South Wales. I'm not sure what they're doing in Queensland and Northern Territory. <laughs> um, but thanks, Kath. I'll hand over to you now. Great. Thanks, Rhiannon, and thanks for the introduction and um, a particular acknowledgement to uh, Judy for her support and encouragement to write the book and again for her support and encouragement to run this uh, webinar and thanks to you, Rhiannon, and the Goulburn Broken CMA team for taking up those suggestions from Judy and, and supporting the project. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, big welcome to everyone that's um, joining today. Really uh, great to have you on board. I'm going to go through the complicated process of sharing my screen. And I'm hoping that is now up, Rhiannon? Yeah. Yes, yep. Uh, yep, got it. Great. And thanks to Kirsty for taking me through that process. Uh, so um, today, uh, as Rhiannon said, we're focusing in on uh, soil testing. It's a program, we're running it as, a th as three two-hour sessions. Um, today, we're going to be really focusing in on the soil testing process part, uh, and then we'll get to more of the interpretation part in the subsequent sessions. What we really want to cover is um, just how to read soil test results and share with you some of the critical limits and target values. I don't know why they just don't do fucking Zoom. It sounds like someone is not muted. Is that, that hopefully that's All right, I've taken enough. care of Yeah, thank you, thank you, Karen. Um, we'll also talk about um, approaches used to develop recommendations and some of the considerations for you when you are 
trying to evaluate the recommendations that you may have been given by an advisor. Uh, in terms of our key messages today, I, I guess one of the things I really want to say and will continue to say over the three sessions is that soil test results are only one piece of the puzzle. Uh, they're not 100% of the story and, and it's really important for you to bring into the soil test your uh, goals, uh, the paddock condition, the soil types, all of those things are also very critical in our consideration of what you might, the decisions that you will make as a result of the soil test. So really important that we're not just <coughs> looking at numbers, but they have to be seen within the context of your, of your goals for your farm. That said, I, I certainly believe that soil testing is a really important tool for managing soil health because it helps us to uh, get a snapshot uh, of what's happening. But most importantly, uh, the third dot point there is that it's a, through a regular sampling regime that you'll be able to see um, uh, trends and compare and all of that then gives you a lot more understanding and confidence with what, what the soil test results are telling you. All right, <clears throat> so before we get into that, um, I just want to again just um, do a little bit of basics on soil and soil health um, because that's the context in which we are then sampling soil. If you have your booklet uh, with you, the soil test step by te step um, book that Rhiannon has sent out, I'm, I'm now referring to pages one and two in the introduction section. So I think um, the key uh, for healthy soils is the physical, chemical and biological properties um, of the soil and for those of you that have heard me speak before, I, I do like to use the analogy of the three-legged stool. Um, that there are three legs to a healthy soil that are holding a healthy soil up. Um, physically, we're talking about fri friable, well-structured, stable soils. Chemically, we're talking about an adequate supply of nutrients for plants. And biologically, we're talking about soil organic matter and having active soil biota to ensure that vital processes in the soil are maintained and being conducted. So they're the, the foundations to a healthy soil, its physical, chemical and biological properties. And I guess with soil testing, we are zooming in on the chemical leg of the stool. So what I just want to make sure that we're all understanding is that we are only talking about one aspect of soil health and there are these other key aspects that we also need to manage. So I'll bring the other legs of the stool in at various, various times through the presentation, but just uh, be mindful of that. So getting right back to basics, what is soil anyway? Uh, well, soil is made up of um, the mineral component that's come from weathering of um, bedrock in soil, or it may have been deposited from the actions of rivers and uh, floods, or it may have been deposited through the action of wind and wind erosion, depositing soil elsewhere. Uh, so that's a major part of what soil is. We also have air, we also have water and we also have organic matter. Organic matter is probably the smallest slice. Uh, most soils you might be talking about 5% um, organic matter in Australian soils. In often cases we've got less than that and in some very productive pasture soils we might have more than that. But I guess um, my key message here is that although organic matter is a very small slice of uh, what makes up soil, it's a very key component, particularly when we're talking about healthy soils 
organic matter is a key to to managing soil health and I'll, I'll keep coming back to that point um, as we go through the sessions. So just a couple of things then on um, soil properties that we um, may continue to refer back to when we're interpreting soil and one is uh, soil texture. So in your booklets I'm referring now to page eight which talks about soil texture. So soil texture is really gives us an indication of the water and nutrient holding capacity in soil. It's the relative proportions of sand, silt and clay. So that mineral component in the previous slide uh, is further uh, dissected into um, relative size portions of minerals. Uh, and sand being the sand and gravel being the largest size, then comes silt and clay being the, the smallest, the finest size. Uh, and it's the relative proportions of those sand, silt and clay particles that gives the soil its texture. We can uh, get an estimate of the texture um, through a field texturing process and it gives us a rough estimate of the percentage of clay. And you can see in the photo there's someone uh, doing a soil texturing uh, process. So it's manipulating that soil out into a ribbon. And as you would expect, the more clay that you have in your soil, the longer the length of that ribbon is likely to be. So it's the length of the ribbon, but it's also the feel of the soil. We know that um, soils that have got a lot of silt in them tend to feel quite soapy and slippery. Uh, and sand of course feels quite gritty. The importance of estimating the percentage of clay is it's the clay fraction that controls much of the physical and chemical properties in soil and that's why we, we will keep coming back and talking about soil texture as we go through uh, because the amount of clay does really influence some of the chemical reactions that are going on. A second property of soil is uh, soil structure uh, and it's really an indicator of soil porosity. So going back to the pie graph, those mineral particles that we've just been talking about, the sand, the silt and the clay, uh, they then bind with organic matter to form aggregates. So it's really through the action of roots, fungal hyphae, uh, bacteria, exudates and so on that bind those particles together to form what we call in soil terminology aggregates or PEDs. And it's the size, the shape and the arrangement of these aggregates and the spaces between them that gives the soil its structure. And soil structure affects plant growth because it really determines pore space, infiltration, drainage, aeration and plant root growth. And you can see in the photo beside there, um, one sample of soil that's quite um, friable. You can imagine crushing that with your hand and it all crumbling up and you can see all the roots that are taking great advantage of that soil structure. And in the other hand, we've got something that is quite uh, solid. Uh, with not much porosity it would take a lot of hand strength to crumble that up. And as you can see, roots find that very difficult to grow through. So soil structure then is a really important aspect of um, so property of, of, so of soils. And the third aspect that I just want to touch on is soil colour, which is really an indication of drainage. Uh, so soil colour really relates to the types of minerals that are present and to the organic matter. In terms of minerals, it's the iron is the most common mineral present in soil that influences soil colour. And as you may recall from some of your, soil, your school chemistry days, um, iron can exist in different oxidation states. So where soil is um, quite well drained, uh, the, the iron will rust in the presence of oxygen and the soil turns red. So you get these much redder colours. Where there's not as much oxygen, um, 
through the action of waterlogging, um, we then tend to get more greys, yellows or red mottles. Um, and these can all indicate periodic waterlogging. The mottling can indicate periodic waterlogging. Whole coloured greys um, can ind indicate more permanent forms of waterlogging. So all Kath, of those, yeah. Kath, sorry, it's Rhiannon. Can I just, um, there's just a little video that's popped up. Oh, now it's me um, as the thumbnail in the corner of your presentation. Yeah. Is, are you able to just shift that? Um, off your screen a little bit. I don't want to. It's just flickering away there, and I think a bit of a distraction. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to get rid of it. No, I'll try to. Um, Here we are. I'll minimise it. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Rhiannon. Okay, so uh, just in terms of uh, common soil profiles. Uh, and I'm now looking at page three in the booklet, you, you'll see that generally soil then is described using those three soil characteristics, colour and how that changes going down the profile, texture and soil structure. And you can see in the profiles in the photo here that soils do differ uh, in their profile section. So, uh, we do see generally some accumulation of organic matter up in the top, so it's some darker soil colour. Uh, but then as we go down the profile, some soils are fairly um, uh, um, much the same from top to depth, uh, fairly uniform. They, they don't change much going down the profile, while other soils we can see some definite changes in soil colour and texture and structure. And these are called soil horizons, so different soil horizons. So you may be familiar with A horizon and B horizon when we're talking about soil. So I just wanted to uh, give those sort of basics as a bit of um, background before we go into soil testing. So the key things there are the components of soil, and then some of the things that we use to describe soil and really understanding that as soil, uh, as we go down the soil profile, soil does change. And that's something that we need to keep in mind when we're doing our soil test. All right, so as uh, Rhiannon said in her introduction, uh, I, I do want to thank all of you who, as you were registering, sent in your questions. Uh, that's given me a lot to um, work with. I've just uh, organised your questions into some themes here and, and it seems like the topics of most interest for you are around soil structure and waterlogging issues, soil phosphorus, soil acidity and lime, soil biology and this whole issue of organic versus chemical amendments cation ratios and soil types. So they're all things that I'll weave in over the three uh, sessions. The questions that were particularly re related to soil testing, which I will um, answer today, are questions around how often it's all, the whole process of soil testing. Um, what are the most important items to look at? Uh, how to relate differing tests for the same mineral? and just trying to make heads or, or tails of the report. So they're all questions that we'll tackle today. So let's get started on that. Um, how frequently should soil be tested for nutrient analysis? Um, what we tend to say is you should soil sample every three to five years. So those of you that are running more intensive operations uh, doing a bit of cropping or have a lot of high stocking rates, if you're in pasture operations, you need to be sampling every three years. But for those of you that are less intensive, um, not as much in terms of stocking and you're not cropping, then probably every five years is going to be enough. Uh, results for things like phosphorus and nitrogen they are likely to change over the three years, um, three to five years. 
uh, whereas things like pH and soil organic carbon will take a bit longer before you start to see shifts in those. So they're just some things to be thinking about. One idea for how you might achieve this is to rotate your testing around the paddocks on the farm. So if you do decide to sample every three years, you could sample a third of your paddocks each year. Uh, and then by the time you come around, you, you've got that three year rotation. So what that will do for you is that instead of looking at a soil test um, and thinking how, you know, what, it, what on earth does this mean? It's very difficult to interpret a one off soil test. But when you've got one from three years prior, uh, we've got a little bit more uh, way of idea of about whether some of these things are increasing or decreasing. We've got some ideas of trends. When you add another one, so you've got um, a third soil test taken three years before that, um, then you can really be a lot more confident in some of the trends that you're picking up. In terms of critical uh, success, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's Rhiannon again. Uh, we just had a question around the depth of um, populations of bacteria and fungi and the hyphae and how far they go down in terms of soil profiles and soil depth? Yeah, good one. Uh, so with um, the soil biota are basically following um, roots. So it depends on how deep your roots are. But wherever there are live functioning roots, there'll be um, organic material. So in general, we see most of the biological activity and organic matter and root mass in the surface soil, in, in, the, in the top soil. Uh, but there will be some uh, at depth, but not, not as much. So the concentration is in the top soil. And then as we get less and less roots as we go down the profile, uh, we also see um, that stratification same stratification with uh, organic matter and uh, biological activity. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. So in terms of some critical success factors, um, that it, so what I'm talking about here is what makes it a soil testing program on your farm successful? There are three things that you need to get right. You need to get your collection method right. You need to be selecting a reliable lab for analysis. And then you need an appropriate interpretation approach. So I'm going to now go through each of those uh, just to give you the key points on how to get this uh, process right. And this is so that when you get your soil test result back, you are confident that it's giving you a, uh, a true reflection of what's happening in your paddock. So where and when and not to sample. Um, so we usually uh, will be saying don't sample anything that's unusual. So where stock camps are, fence lines, headlands if you're cropping, um, drains, poorly drained areas and so on. So in a normal soil testing process, you would avoid those areas. You might want to, however, specifically sample an area that is poorly drained because you want to investigate what some of the issues might be for plant, why plants may not be performing in that area. But just keep that area separate. So sample from a paddock point of view, uh, keeping free of all of those areas I've just mentioned, uh, put that in one bag for sampling, uh, for testing. But you may want to particularly investigate an unusual area. And in that case, you, you would keep it separate. Best to avoid uh, paddocks or areas that have been recently limed or fertilised. Uh, this is very much influenced by soil moisture as to how long you need to leave it. So if um, we're experiencing this very dry spring at the moment around here, 
um, you know, if you'd only just applied some fertiliser or lime, then you just need to uh, understand that it's going to take a little bit longer before that is fully assimilated within the soil and ready for soil testing again. It's best to sample according to soil type and to land form, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and best to sample at the same time um, each year. My preference is to sample when the soil is soft so that you've got an, uh, a, an easy way of getting your auger in or your sampler in uh, so it's a bit easier to take the sample. So I would be suggesting spring, but in fact it doesn't really matter when you sample, just as long as you keep sampling at that same time. So in terms of areas to avoid, um, this was a great little piece of work that was done by Austin Brown um, a, quite a while ago now, but still rings true today. And what he did was just looked at um, sampling uh, in a grid formation, uh, you can see here across the paddock, and just looking at what all the different um, results for Olsen P that would come up. So you can certainly see the pattern that I've just been talking about, uh, that near the gate we're seeing elevated uh, levels of Olsen P uh, around the water trough, you, you're starting to see some elevation and along tree lines where the stock might be camping, you're seeing elevation. So that's why we're saying um, just steer clear of gateways, water troughs, fence lines uh, and sample elsewhere. Uh, this was some really interesting work that was done by the Crichton Creeks Land Care Group uh, on Terry Hubbard's place and really shows the influence of landform. Uh, so here we've got uh, a paddock, I'll just put a squiggle on this slide, hopefully you'll see that. So we've got some lower slopes in the paddock, then we had some mid slopes and then we've got this upper slope up here all in this, oops, all in the same paddock. And what the land care group did was uh, sample each of those areas separately and then have a look at the results. They also sampled the um, nitrogen and the, sorry, the north side and the south side of the slopes. Um, to have a look at that. So you can see that as we're going up the slope, um, things like nitrogen, things like phosphorus and things like potassium are all increasing. So I'm going to try a little experiment here, Rhiannon, just to check everyone's still awake and um, with us on this journey. I'm wondering if they could start typing into the chat box, why would this be the case? Why would we be seeing higher levels of nutrient on the upper slope than on the lower slope. So Rhiannon, as you see some of those answers come through, could you um, read them out for me, please? Sure, yep. And feel free, those of you without the chat box, to email me. Oh yeah, thank you. Sorry, we've got quite a number of people who don't have the chat function, which we'll try to... Oh, okay. Yeah. Connect. Um, leaching from water flow from Jen, water runoff, movement of nutrients downslope with water flow. Yeah, well, in fact, it's going the other way. So we've got high nutrient on the top of the slope, not on the bottom of the slope. So why would that be the case? Any other thoughts, Rhiannon? Cattle stays higher up the slope. Um, yeah. Stock, stock on the text line. We've got technology yeah. flying around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so we're certainly on the right track now. So as you, as as many of you are starting to point out, it's the behaviour of your stock that are actually moving the nutrient around. Uh, they love to camp on the top. They love to sit in the sun. So, um, and there you have it. You know, if you look at the upper slope on the north side, 
uh, we're seeing the highest levels of nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. And what that's uh, indicating is that um, stock are camping up there. And as you can imagine, what might be growing up there was a whole lot of cape weed, really enjoying this high nutrient um, status. So what had been happening on Terry's site before this was um, he was dutifully taking his soil test, but uh, blending it all together uh, so the lower slope, mid slope and um, a high slope and getting us one soil test result uh, and the advice was put more nutrient on. Uh, but you can certainly see that if he was able to change his uh, animal grazing behaviour, he'd be able to manipulate his nutrient. He's got more than enough and in fact up, the, up on the top of the slope in way in excess of what he needs. So what the land care group then did was um, to use fencing to modify stock behaviour and force stock back down onto the lower slope uh, to camp there and in that way try and reverse this nutrient trend. So I'm just showing you this to show the influence of landform on test results and why if you have this type of uh, landform on your property that you might need to sample your lower slopes separately if they're all in the same paddock a low lower slope mid slope and upper slope you would be well advised to sample those um, sections separately uh, so that you can pick up uh, on this um, effect that may be happening on your place so thanks to everyone that um, contributed to that discussion. Kath, there was just one further question on there, if, if you don't mind, about yeah. I think it's the the um, potassium and the difference in the south and the north slope uh, uh, in upper, the upper slope. Yeah. Uh, so north and south um, on the upper slope, the differences, yeah, it's a very big difference. It's a very big difference. Um, so again, it would be down to um, the animal stock camps preferring to camp on the north side and uh, in the urine, uh, you get a lot of potassium coming out as well as nitrogen. Yep. Thanks, Kath. No worries. Okay, so where to take the cause? Um, uh, again, this is in the soil test book as well. It, it, grids are probably the easiest way to do you, to, for, for you to uh, do soil sampling because um, it's a bit easier to visualise and get yourself a bit of a path. Uh, you can do transects as well and you can do zigzagging. The important thing is that you get an even coverage across your paddock. Uh, you need to be taking around 25 to 30 cores uh, to make up your paddock sample. Um, so you sort of need around half a kilo, something like that. 300 grams is what the laboratory will require. Um, so if you sort of aim for half a kilo and then you can um, mix that bag up and then subsample out of that. So that's um, an idea of using a grid, uh, but you can use other patterns. The main thing is that you get good even coverage. How deep do we go? Uh, this was some really good work again by Austin Brown uh, in the Department of Primary Industries that just had a look at this of what would be the effect of uh, varying your sampling depth on Olsen P. So you can see on the far right hand side, uh, the core went down to 30 centimetres and he got an Olsen P level of four. Uh, at 10 centimetres, an Olsen P of 15, and at 2 centimetres, an Olsen P of 9. So 
the effect of sampling depth is quite strong for, for nutrient. Uh, so as you go deeper, there'll be less uh, nutrient in your sample. But if you go to, um, sorry, if you go too shallow, you'll get a lot more. So that's instead of nine, that's 29, sorry, at the two centimetre, 29 there. So that affects the interpretation. So um, if you, your advisor would be saying with an Olsen P of four that you need to put um, a lot of fertiliser on, you, you're way too low on your phosphorus level. Um, and also if you sample too shallowly and you got a very high result, um, your advisor will be saying, no need, you don't need to put fertiliser on this year. Whereas in fact, uh, you're sort of right bang in the middle. So you probably needed a bit of maintenance uh, to maintain that. So you can see then that sampling depth is really critical. It's one of the critical things you've got to get right in um, soil sampling. We, uh, our standard for pastures is 0 to 10. So you need to sample 0 to 10 centimetre uh, and send that off to uh, the laboratory. There may be times though where you want to get a deeper sample and you sample that separately. So you would sample, um, it might be a, a 10 to 30 centimetre core or even deeper in some of the, the croppers will be sampling down to 60 centimetres. And what they're trying to look at there is looking for deeper nitrogen that the crop may be able to access. So there are times when you do want to sample uh, deeper, where you're looking for deep reserves of, nit of uh, nutrient. Uh, you may be wanting to check for stratification of uh, nutrients. You might be looking for a subsoil constraint. Um, so in some cases where you might be considering lucin, for example, which is a very deep rooted crop, will definitely go down into the B horizon. One of the key things that you're advised to do is sample your um, pH and aluminium levels at depth because leucine is very uh, sensitive to pH and aluminium. Um, also, I, I know some of you have got vines and orchards, so definitely where you've got a vine and an orchard crop, you are also encouraged to sample deeper because those crops all have deeper roots. And so you do want to know what's going down at depth. So there are times when you want to sample deeper, but in general for pasture and for cropping, it's a 0 to 10 centimetre uh, sample. And there are occasions when you might want to take a deeper sample uh, than that. I should just say for vines and orchards as well, uh, rather than the strict grid sampling pattern, you would be sampling in the vine row or in the tree row. Uh, and um, closer to the tree, just sort of within the, the drip line of the tree. Uh, so there are some special nuances to all of this sampling process that I'm talking about, depending on your crop, but the majority of you are pasture and crop and croppers. So that's what I'm sort of mostly aiming this at. So how do we sample? Um, we don't do it like the hand-drawn diagram on the far right there. Uh, we don't do it with a shovel. Uh, given what we've just been talking about, the influence of depth, you really need to have something that will give you a precise 0 to 10 centimetre sample. So you can borrow some foot operated uh, samplers uh, through Landcare groups and CMAs will often have a supply of samplers that you can borrow. So I'll just check with you, Rhiannon, that's still a, an option for people. Uh, yes, Kath, uh, Golden Broken CMA with offices in Shepparton, Benalla and Yay definitely have some soil corers and also Agvic um, often 
have them. Although your best bet if you're local to us is to, to try to come to the CMA because we're just having issues right now with COVID restrictions. Of course, yes, it's complicating everything. Um, but in general, you can borrow um, a saw Cora or your advisor may have a, a, some sort of mounted sampling device like the one on the left there and um, they may be able to come out and do the sampling for you. But you need it done uh, precisely, not, not to 10 centimetres. Just a couple of things about sample hygiene um, then. It's, it is really important that you think about hygiene of your sampler, of the sampling equipment and what you're putting it in and even your hands. So laboratories tell us that um, they're often finding traces of fertilizer and lime that's really been um, people have put their sample in an old fertiliser bag or they've um, put it on the ute and there was um, fertiliser on the ute. So you do really need to uh, just think about keeping that whole process um, clean uh, and even on your hands you can have um, various uh, oils and, and things on your hands. So just being very mindful about how you keep your sample clean. And transport. Um, so ideally you would have your sample delivered to the lab within 48 hours. I understand at the moment with the way um, the postage is that's going to be difficult. Uh, but just take care not to um, put samples in so that they're sitting in a dispatch centre uh, over the weekend. What we're really needing to be careful of is uh, bags that are all sealed up and they have to be in order to post them um, but then sitting in something quite warm. So that just gets activates then all the soil biology that are in your sample and they start um, uh, releasing nutrients, tying nutrients up, doing all sorts of things. We, we don't really know all, all the impacts that could be have being had on your sample at that point. So, so thinking about how you get your sample to the laboratory in the quickest time possible is, is a real key here. All right, so having put in all that hard work with uh, getting a sample, you now want to select a laboratory um, and what I would be saying is the most important thing is that the laboratory is certified. So at a, at a minimum the laboratory needs to be OSPAC certified um, so that's certifying their accuracy so they to be certified by OSPAC are involved in inter-laboratory sample comparisons uh, and they as a lab have to get their accuracy within a defined uh, error margin. So it's your guarantee that the laboratory are using the methods um, correctly, they've got a good um, process and protocols in the laboratory and can get um, the result within a defined uh, error mar margin in comparison to other laboratories. So you can go onto the OSPAC uh, website there and find out if the laboratory that you're thinking of sending it to, your sample to, is um, certified. If possible, it's also um, good to go for something that's NADA accredited. NADA is a, a much harder um, standard for a laboratory to get. Uh, and it's really related to their quality control standards within uh, the laboratory. And lastly, just making sure that they are certified for the tests that you're using. So often some laboratories will say that they are OSPAC accredited, uh, but they might be only OSPAC accredited for a certain number of tests. 
and not all of the ones that you want to be testing for. So just, um, just make yourself aware of the laboratory and the cert certification status of the laboratory that you're thinking of using. Once all that's been ticked off, then there's some other things that you might want to think about when you're selecting a laboratory. Is it using um, standard published procedures that are calibrated for Australia? Um, it, it does worry me a little bit that we do have um, people here that are sending samples to America uh, and other countries for analysis. Um, our soils in Australia are very unique. They're quite different. And so our uh, standards for classifying soil is also quite different to make up for that. Our soils are a lot more leached, have a lot less organic carbon in them, um, and so on. So it's, I believe it's really important that you are using, that the procedures uh, that you're using are calibrated for Australia. Um, check on your service standards. So, you know, how long will you have to wait for your report and how easy is it to understand the report? You know, how is it going to be presented to you? Then you might think about value for money and then you might also think about will they support me with some advice or are they going to give me some sampling equipment or do they send me the bags to put my sample in? Those sort of things may also come into a consideration there. So they're all the things that I think you should um, tick off when you are deciding which laboratory do I send um, my sample to. All right, so what I want to do now is um, is just tackle some of the uh, questions that had come up um, in the uh, registration process. So I do thank you for using that process to pose some of your questions because it just helps me understand what you really want to talk about. Uh, right, so the one question was, um, what are the priorities in the soil test report? Um, which was a great question and got me thinking there. But I guess for me, when I'm looking at a soil test uh, report, the top three for a pasture situa situation really are uh, soil pH and aluminium levels, soil phosphorus and organic carbon. Um, they're your sort of big three that I tend to go to straight away to have a look at what it gives you a sense of what's going on uh, in the soil. Now, yes, the, all the other things are important um, and all give you a, a, a better picture about what's happening in the soil. But for me, they're my top three. Um, and I guess, again, I just want to reiterate the key message for today, which is really a, about adopting a regular sampling regime. Um, because seeing a one-off soil phosphorus result, it, it gives you a snapshot in time, but it's really hard to know what's going on, whether it's in a process of increasing or whether it's in a process of decreasing uh, and so on. So being able to get a sense for the trend gives you a lot more understanding of what's happening in your soil and a lot more confidence about the soil test and your interpretation. So they're, they're my sort of top, top three um, priorities when I'm looking at a soil test. And the other question was this one, how to relate differing tests for the same nutrient? And again, I'll say thank you for putting that question up there because it really um, highlights the fact that for each nutrient, there is a whole range of different tests that could be used um, to test for it. 
So I want to just take our time a little bit in explaining this one and, and talking through it. Um, so there's some important terms and concepts that I think are useful to just um, get a good understanding of at this juncture, at this point, in order to answer this question. The first one is the term available, which you do often see on a soil test. And it's really referring to the amount of nutrient that the plant can readily access. And I think from my perspective, it's a little bit misleading for a soil test to, to use the term available because it makes you think that that is what is the amount, the amount of nutrient that is there. Really, what they're referring to is extractable. That is the amount of nutrient that can be extracted using a specific um, uh, chemical to extract it. To estimate the amount of available nutrient. So all of these soil tests have been developed by various soil chemists over time as a way of estimating the amount of nutrient that is available and or the amount of nutrient that might become available during a growing season. So I think it's important just to um, think about those two terms, available and what does that actually mean and extractable. That is on all of those soil tests, it's a soil chemist's best estimate of what is available. There's also this term total that you often see on a soil test, which is the total amount of nutrient that is in the soil. And that includes the amount that is available and the two could be quite different. So often we'll see very large amounts as total amount of nutrient, but only a small portion of that is going to be available uh, to the plants. And that's all down to the chemical and biological processes that are happening in the soil at the time. And there's this other term called exchangeable, and that is the amount of nutrient that's held on the surfaces of things like clays and um, charged surfaces of organic matter. So how does this all fit together in answering this question of how do um, differing tests relate? So I want to show you this slide. It's a little bit busy, so I apologise for that and I, um, I will sort of take you through it. It's a great slide, I believe, in helping us understand what is going on in soil that influences nutrient availability. So the first thing I want to point out is this soil solution pool here. So this is the um, nutrients that are available and they're directly available then for roots to take up, for root uptake. They take it out of the soil solution pool. Feeding into that pool are nutrients that are in the mineral phase, that is they are um, in a crystalline form within the mineral or they could be on the surface of the mineral and they are exchangeable and can desorb into the soil solution pool or can be adsorbed back oh, sorry back onto out of the soil solution and onto the mineral surface. So this is a dynamic that's going on all the time between what's on the surface of the minerals and what's in the soil solution. At the same time that that's going on, we have this pool over here. The nutrients that are um, incorporated in organic matter and the nutrients that are incorporated in the microbial biomass, that is all the things that are alive, the bacteria, the funguses and so on. And these 
feed into the soil solution pool too through a process called mineralization. However, nutrients that are in the soil solution can also be immobilized back into the organic phase. So it's a very busy slide because it is depicting a very busy process that's going on in soil all at once. These, it's a very dynamic situation in soil for, for nutrients. They are being desorbed and adsorbed. They are being mineralized and immobilized through the mineral phase and through the organic phase. And while all of that's going on, you come along up the top here on the soil surface and stick a soil test corer in and take a sample. So it comes back to this issue of it's a snapshot in time of the amount of nutrient that might be in this soil solution pool at the time. But we know with things like nitrogen and sulphur, which spend all of their time in this organic phase here, if it's a warm day, spring, it's warming up, soils are warming, then we might see more nitrogen than if we were sampling in winter when it's cold and wet and the microbial biomass isn't um, pumping stuff out as much. Uh, compared with something like potassium, which spends all its time here in the exchangeable and mineral phase and is totally dominated by these processes of desorption and adsorption. As compared to phosphorus, which has some of its uh, availability determined by this mineral phase and some of its availability determined by this organic phase as well. So there's a lot of complexity within our soils in regard to these nutrient pools and the nutrient pathways to the root. So what does that all mean in terms of this question of how to relate differing tests for the same nutrient? Each test has been designed using a specific method or, and chemical extractant to estimate the amount of available nutrient, that is the amount that's sitting in that soil solution pool. And some also take a bit of nutrient that might become available. Um, so some soil tests are designed to take a little bit off the mineral phase that's sitting there and desorb some of that off. So in conclusion then, differing tests are then not really comparable because they're using different ways of estimating this amount of new available nutrient. But what is absolutely true is that you do need to know what test has been used in order to have any hope of interpreting what it means. And for me, I think also it, it has implications then for the basis of the interpretation. Uh, is it based on field trial work that's relevant to your area? Um, or is it based on local knowledge and experience? Or is it based on something else? And it's really important for you to know when you're talking with your advisor, what is the basis of their interpretation? What are they using? Um, to interpret this result for you. All right, and then the final question was a really a statement saying I can't make heads nor tails of the report and I guess that really was leading me to, a, to an ad, Rhiannon, to say come back next time. Um, so I think I might leave it there and just see what questions are coming through the chat chat function or through your email, Rhiannon. Thanks, Kath. 
Um, so, um, Peter has asked, um, is an aerator useful for soil management? Thanks, Peter. Um, I think an aerator can be useful uh, for soil management. So what the aerator is doing is um, shattering uh, and disturbing the soil, um, which can be then good for breaking up um, hard setting soils and enabling roots to get further down and penetrate further into the soil. I guess the key thing is that um, one of the things we'll talk about next time is really checking the disperse, dispersibility of your soil um, and we look and it's on a soil test specifically at the percentage of sodium, uh, exchangeable sodium on your soil test. So if that is above six, and if your calcium magnesium ratio is uh, falling below two, then it means your soil is likely to disperse. So when you put things like aerators and deep rippers and um, tines through your soil, um, instead of the soil remaining open and fractured after that um, aerator going through, uh, it can, after rain, just disperse and meld all back together again and set as hard as a rock again. So that's one of the things you just need to check on uh, and we'll talk about that next, next time in the next workshop. <coughs> So I might leave further explanation till then, if that's Thanks. okay. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. Um, did you have more slides, Kath? Because I've got, I've, I do have about ten questions. So um, I, I don't. No, I don't have any more slides. That's the end. All right. Excellent. So from Jonathan on email, um, he has a question around the grid sampling mm. and how important it is to replicate a similar grid pattern in the following years of soil testing. So is using a diagonal line, so you've got marked posts and you're using that same line across the paddock um, as an easy way to replicate that. Is that enough or is that too simple for a full paddock? No, that's, that, that's enough. So you can do transects and as you say, leave um, pegs along the fence line so you can ref you can find them again next time and re re-step out your transect and, and take your samples that way. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Yep. It's uh, As I said, it's about the important thing is getting coverage um, and feeling as though you have covered uh, the paddock adequately. Uh, just on that, um, Susie had a question in the chat that um, I'm just trying to find it that I took the liberty of answering that, so you can uh, <laughs> you can give me some points or not um, for correct answer. So um, Susie was asking how many samples in what size paddock and was is there a rule of thumb for paddock size and that was with in relation to um, Terry Hubbard's paddock so um which was a really massive paddock um but still uh, we took around 15 to 30 samples um per soil test so com for per combined sample um and the rule of thumb is that there are 25 to 30 soil cores from the paddock gives you a good representative sample and that any more effort after that generally does not yield a better quality data. Yeah, look, I, I think I would agree with that, um, Rhiannon. So again, it is about the coverage and um, um, I, I would fully support your answer of um, 25 to 30. I, I had said 30 to 40 cores. So I guess I'd be sort of leaning towards the 30 side, but um, it's it's about that coverage. And as you say, within the at the Terry Hubbard site, by the time you 
divided it into three, you ended up with quite small areas. So it might have 25 probably was adequate. Mm. Mm. In in um, some fairly solid rock. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that yes, one. you've got to take into account all those issues. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kath. Uh, the next question is about water logging. Um, so pugging is an issue for a lot of people at the moment. So the question is about are there actions that we can take to repair soil structure after pugging? Um, has the soil lost nutrients or changed in its pH status in any way as a result of that water logging? I don't think so. Um, sometimes in waterlogged conditions, you can get issues with manganese. So manganese can become more uh, available in, in waterlogged acidic soils. Um, but I, I think the waterlogging issue and the pugging is more of a soil physical issue. Um, and so you will have likely suffered some compaction um, deeper down. So as the animals um, sink down, um, that is beginning to form compaction layers within the soil. Uh, so what can be done about that? Um, certainly some uh, organic, you know, really being focused on building organic matter in those soils to repair that soil structure will be very important. It's where some aerating or deep ripping could be something you might look at, but again, you would really need to check your dispersibility issues. Getting deeper rooted pasture paddock, pasture species into the paddock will be very important because they will be creating that those holes in, in and porosity for you um, through that compacted layer. And I guess in going forward, it's really uh, about trying to think through how do we stop this issue from occurring uh, next time. So it's questions then about um, stock management and how you might be able to manage your stock so that you don't get um, those pugging because it is quite um, destructive in terms of that compaction layer. Um, it can can then become quite a serious issue within your soil. So some options to think about is are there some drier uh, hill areas that you could um, assign stock to while the flatter areas that are more vulnerable to water logging um, dry out before you reintroduce stock. Um, can you use stock containment areas in those uh, wet periods uh, so that you again don't sacrifice large areas of your land um, to pugging and um, compaction by stock? Um, is it better to um, contain them and um, reduce the area that that is affected. So in effect, um, yeah, containing the stock much much like you would in a drought situation, uh, but in a wet situation. So there, there's some things to talk about. Certainly, talking with your advisor on that one would be a useful thing to do. Um, and yeah, pugging and, and compaction are, are real issues that you, you do need to think about how do we stop it from, or, or try and reduce the impacts as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Kath. Can I, um, I've just noticed too that on your slide, um, is it okay if we stop your screen sharing now? Kath? Yeah, let's, let's do that. I'll just note that session two is actually um, Monday the 12th of October um, and the reason that we've put such a big um, gap in between session one and oh, two is, right. is to allow you to go and take uh, soil samples, send them off and get the results back um, before we sit down again in front of our computers so you've got some um, 
you have got some real time uh, information in front of you. Um, uh, my apologies for putting the wrong date on. <laughs> that's all right. Oh dear, sorry about that. No, that's all right. Um, so I have another question and I think it's in chat and you've answered it um, in a uh, gone some way to answering it in talking about aeration. Um, but tillage, is it beneficial beneficial or detrimental to soil health? And um, that's from Dallas. Gosh, these guys know how to ask all the hard questions, don't they? <laughs> Controversy. <laughs> Big one. Um, yeah. Oh, look. I think um, certainly uh, continuous cultivation, there's no doubt about it, it does have a negative impact on soil. So when times go through the soil, they are breaking open aggregates, they are exposing. Uh, organic matter that would have been hidden within those aggregates uh, to organisms that can then break it down. So what we tend to see then is that soils that are continuously cultivated tend to have low levels of organic matter. And with low levels of organic matter comes poor soil structure. So, and they're a lot more exposed to wind erosion, water erosion, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, issues against uh, tillage. But where you might have a one-off tillage event, uh, so that might be where you are trying to uh, establish a pasture or, um, you know, sow a, a cover crop or a, um, um, do a one-off crop to control a weed issue that you might have or something like that, then the soil will be able to recover. Um, it, it will recover uh, as it goes back into the pasture phase. We see a rebuilding of organic matter and soil structure then begins to improve um, as a result. So, uh, what do you call that, Rhiannon, sitting on the fence? Uh, a yes and a no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a, it's not black and white, and I guess that's the thing about soil, is that there are very few black and white answers to, the, to these questions. Mm. Thanks, Kath. Um, well, uh, so here's a curly one for you then, maybe. Um, Anthony uh, on email has asked, how this conversation about soil testing and how does it fit with the current conversations around regenerative agriculture and the talk around that and fertiliser input um, and in particular Regen Ag is talking about carbon in soil. Yeah thanks Anthony, uh, great question and yeah I'm, I'm a great believer in organic matter and that's how I kicked off this whole presentation was to say that um, when we're talking about soil tests we are generally talking about one leg of the stool only and that's the chemical leg um, but the other two legs are very important for supporting soil health and, and one of those is the uh, soil biology and organic matter um, leg. The, the biological properties of the soil are very important and within that organic matter plays a, an absolutely critical role. So organic matter plays a critical role on all three legs. So it, it, it's known to improve soil physical properties. So soil structure is improved by organic matter. Um, and it also improves uh, a lot of nutrients are tied up in organic matter. So um, it can be a nutrient source, but also with having healthy uh, uh, levels of soil bio biology will mean that some of those critical biological processes that are important for nutrient availability uh, do go ahead. So very important um, and I guess maybe your question was questioning, I think I may have mentioned fertiliser at some point, so you might have been, that might have been what has prompted your question. 
Um, so I'm using the term fertiliser in its broadest sense in terms of, you know, adding nutrient in, in however form, whatever form you may like to, to add the nutrient. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, chemical fertiliser, but it is one of the questions that I do, that I will uh, address a bit more. There was a question about, um, that came through in the registration, Rhiannon, about, uh, organic versus chemical amendments on soil and its impact on soil biology. So it is something I will um, talk about um, in one of the later sessions. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. So um, just on organic amendments and building soil organic matter, uh, Catherine has asked what are the best ways to build soil organic matter? And should we introduce off-farm materials such as mulch or straw? Um, should they be tested? Is there a risk of introducing bad bacteria? Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, and we will sort of come back to this when we, we'll, we will have a, a bit of a session next time on soil organic matter and how to build soil organic matter. Um, the best way, I'll say, I'll say the sentence first and explain it. The best way to build organic matter is through uh, plant roots. And the best plant roots to do that with are grass roots. Um, so they're very, grass roots are very fibrous um, and fine uh, roots. And so uh, uh, they then build organic matter very effectively. Um, but in terms of my use of the term best, I guess what I'm meaning is it's probably your most um, low cost and sustainable ways of doing it. You can, of course, bring in organic matter if you wanted to. So you can bring it in in the form of manures and composts and hays and all of those sort of things. Now they will all immediately add organic carbon and organic matter into the soil. But what happens is that the soil biology then begin to consume that organic matter and decompose it. And what we know is the vast majority of that organic matter will um, be consumed and released as carbon dioxide, as those organisms de do that decomposition. So you can't bring in a, for those of you in, in a garden situation will know, a one-off application of compost doesn't last. You have to put it back on again next year and the next year and the next year. So it's, it's not a, it's not a one-off, okay, I've, I've built my organic matter, now I can concentrate on something else. So that's one of the issues with bringing organic matter in, is that you have to then continue it if you want to maintain that amount in your soil. Um, and I guess the, the questioner there, sorry, I've forgotten her name. Catherine. Catherine was alluding to is exactly right is that you do have to be quite careful about where you're where you're getting it from what the properties are of it and do you want that um, on your soil so yeah i mean there's um there are ways of buying certified composts and all those sort of things that you can have a bit more confidence in um, but I think, you know, from a, from a longer term perspective and from a broad acres perspective, um, having a really good grassy pasture is um, perhaps a more sustainable in the long term way of building organic matter. Thanks, Kath. Um, so we've just got a couple more uh questions to get through it's um it's nearly 20 to 12. um john on in the chat box has asked do extractable and total numbers in a report account for the soil biology in that sample required to perform the extraction 
or is that based on a standard or ideal biology level? For example, if you have a theoretically high extractable amount, um, but without the biology, is it not available? Does a test account for that? Mm, good question. Um, so, as I said, in the soil test, um, in the laboratory, uh, the laboratory are using a, a chemist's method that they've invented um, to extract a certain amount of that nutrient out of the soil sample. Um, and so, in a way, it's their way of estimating what is available. So it's um, independent, if you like, of any biological process. It's what it's estimating what is in that soil solution at that moment, at that time. So what has become available through biological processes, what has become available through the desorption and absorption processes on the on the minerals. So it's a it's a snapshot of what is available at that time. And therefore not requiring any further biological process. Um, but uh, I guess what that question is pointing to is that it is only that it is a snapshot in time. And, you know, once the soil starts warming up, coming into spring or, um, or, you know, in autumn when we've got warm soil and we get the first lot of rains, um, that's when we see a lot of biological activity happening in the soil and we get these big flushes of uh, nitrogen, for example, becoming available, um, soft sulphur and all those uh, elements that are very dependent on biological processes. So it, it is only that, it is only a snapshot in time, which is why I've been trying to emphasise this idea of a regular sampling regime, a regular sampling program, so that you are sampling at the same time every year and you're starting to see a trend. So that regular um, sampling and that trend in plant available and those uh, figures reported in your soil test. Um, uh, so that's an excellent snapshot of at this time. And then as you say, we take that over a time scale and you, you get to see the trend and you can maybe relate that back to your ac actions and activities in the paddock. When you are looking at a report for something like total P, um, so whilst that might be what your soil has, um, is there a way to determine what may then become released to become plant available into the future? So how that pool operates. Mm. And I guess at that point, uh, Rhiannon, you, you enter the... Uh... <laughs> The world of the soil chemist and you know them inventing tests to to try and do that um, so for example we have um, you know when we come to talk about phosphorus we'll be talking about the olsen p and the colwell p both being perhaps the most used of our testing procedures for phosphorus um, now, both of them use the same extractant. It's just that the Colwell P is the sample is shaken for longer and the soil chemists will argue that that then gives you a sense of not only what is immediately available, but what will become available during that season. That's their argument for developing that test. So, um, yeah, that's, does yeah. that sort of answer it a bit, Rhiannon? Uh, I think so. We'll have to hear from John in the chat box if we got to, <laughs> got to 
<laughs> where um, he wanted us to. Um, we have a uh, comment from Alfred that says, without water, there is no soil solution. So irrigation is handy and climate change slash droughts are disastrous for plant nutrition. Yes, um, good point, Alfred. Um, you know, droughts, as we know, are not that great for plant growth. Um, and it's not just about nutrient availability, it is just about the availability of water. I guess soil solution is used, um, and it may make it sound like, you know, very wet, soppy soil, but it's important to note that soil uh, water is held in, it's held in soil in very, very fine pores. Uh, so very small pores it can hold water through capil capillary action. So nutrient can still be there in the soil solution um, and, and still be available to plants. Uh, but certainly, you know, in drought situations, um, it's, you know, plants need water, definitely, yeah. Uh, thanks, Kath. Uh, Jen has a question um, around how to get soil tested for pollutants like lead. Um, so that's a where to go to, I think. Yeah, look, there there are a few specialised laboratories that um, will do what you're looking for is heavy metal contamination type testing. Um, so there are a few laboratories around that will um, do that for you. I think there's one in Melbourne and I'm pretty sure there's also one in um, South Australia as well. Uh, but maybe we could take that on as homework and um, we can um, send that through, Rihanna. Sure. sure. Um, and um, your presentation, Kath, I know it reflects a lot of the um, content from the booklet. Um, the busy diagram showing how busy soil <laughs> is, um, is that, could you remind me if that's in the booklet? I don't think it. No, it's not. Um, it's so not. are you happy if we share your presentation or if I share that diagram with participants? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so it is referenced um, to the Soil Analysis and Interpretation Manual, uh, which was published um, many, many years ago, but remains one of our key standard texts from a soil science uh, perspective. It is a CSIRO publication and some very eminent soil scientists um, have contributed to to that manual. So I, I thoroughly recommend the book. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to find it uh, in a library. You don't necessarily have to borrow it. Uh, but just, you know, if if the presentation goes out, it does need to, we, we all need to acknowledge the work that um, that, that is representing is not my work. Uh, and it is these soil scientists' uh, work. So I have referenced it. As long as people keep those references um, to acknowledge that, that would be good. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. I did see that uh, reference, but couldn't recall it from the top of my head. Um, sorry, I'm just wearing, uh, wondering, I've got questions everywhere. Um, we've just got a couple more to go because I am mindful of the time. Um, Christine on email has asked, are there advantages to leaving rocks interspersed in the soil? And does size matter? Size of the rock, I presume. Yep. Yeah. I'd say, um, yep, yeah, from, from, I suppose, rocks to boulders. Yeah. Look, I think if you've got rocks in your soil, you've got rocks in your soil. There's sort of not a lot you can... Um, do about it. One of the impacts of having rocks in your soil is where you've got a rock, you can't have soil moisture or or nutrient. It's not going to be there. So the more rocks you have, then um, the less moisture 
your soil will be able to hold for plant growth and the less um, nutrient um, holding capacity the soil will have as well. But, uh, you know, it all depends on what you're trying to do with your um, paddock and your soil. If, it, if you're interested in growing uh, native species and um, native grasses and so on, they will sit quite happily in low for the it, it, It's not a, um, it, it just, depends on what you're trying to do, what your goals are. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kath. Um, and um, Judy on email has said, regarded the lead testing uh, for Jen, um, try ALS in Melbourne. They may Thank do it. Yeah, that Thank will you, also Judy. follow that. Oh, and so has Neil has said SGS and ALS will both analyse for heavy metals like lead. Thanks, Neil and Judy. Um, and we're coming to our last question, I think. Sorry, I'm going up and down my chat box. Um, from Nicholas was wondering if he might be able to share his screen to show some pictures of nutrient deficiencies and if he may be able to identify with which nutrient Thanks. Um, do you think that's a live um, exercise, Kath, or, or maybe Nick can send those through and um, and we can have a look yes. at them out of session and send them back? What do you? Sounds like a test to me. Well, fully disclosed, <laughs> Nick. I'm terrible at the technology side of this. If you um, if you haven't figured that out. Um, yeah, so a three. test on technology, but also a test on me as to whether I'll be able to recognise um, things. Yeah. So it's a look. It's a great um, question, and I'm happy to to take a look. But I will say this: that I'm I don't consider myself to be an expert in being able to tell from a photo whether. Um, something is nutrient deficient. Um, but I guess the point is worth making here that um, trying to diagnose from plant um, symptoms is not always that accurate. And that's where a soil test really comes into its own because you can really see what's going on. Because the other things that can mimic um, nutrient deficiency is that it, you know there could be disease issues there could be insect issues um, all those sort of things can blend in with nutrient issues as well and uh, it makes diagnosis quite um, a bit a bit hairy so my suggestion is um, if you think there is a nutrient issue get the soil tested yep all right thanks kath um Nicholas, can I suggest, or Nick, um, that you email me some photos and we'll um, have a look at just taking on board exactly what um, Kath has said regarding the soil testing, um, but just have a look for you. And um, I think that is um, the end of the questions, Kath. So um, thank, thank you. So I just need to recap. Um, thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. I know it's been a... Um, a long session, um, but just run through a couple of things. Um, because we had these chat box issues and not everyone could see them, I'll try and grab the ones that we didn't speak about um, and send them um, with an email. Uh, that email will also include a link to um, an evaluation for today, um, and that will be important because we'd like to be able to improve um, what we can to make our session two on the 12th of October a better experience for you if possible. Um, I've just put the evaluation link into the chat box for those that can see it. I will also email it to you along with the recording of today. Um, I might also take the time between the sessions to lobby <laughs> for a different different platform um, because it, it is a bit of a shame that, that not everyone can participate in the same way. Um, thank you, Kath, for the presentation um, and your very thoughtful and um, 
clear answers to the questions. Um, for me, I really like the three-legged stool as a way of visualising um, the importance of all three, the, the, the physical, the chemical and the biological components, and to <laughs> try to think about those things um, when I'm thinking about soil and maybe what the issue is or what the management requirement is. Um, and thank you also for the booklet um, that you have authored because um, I've got quite a number of questions about those booklets. So to all those people that have asked for a copy, I will get back to you and post it out. Um, it's also available online. Um, there's a link on the flyer that you got. Um, and just a reminder that we have left space between these sessions. So if you want to grab some soil samples, um, go out now, send them out. I've, I've rung a bunch of labs and their turnaround time despite COVID is good. Um, it's probably just Australia Post <laughs> that may hold them up. So there's definitely time to get those samples sent and your results back in time for session two. Um, I, I've probably said five times now, the recording uh, will be emailed to you. Um, also in that booklet, um, there uh, there is further reading on some of the comment, um, topics that Kath has covered today and we'll cover in the next sessions. Um, yeah, and thank you uh, for your attendance today. We hope that you found the session valuable um, and then we look forward to seeing you on Monday the 12th of October. So thank you everyone. Thanks Rhiannon, that was great.